How many of you guys are ready to get in the Word today? Yeah. And I'm going to do a two-week series called You Belong Here. Everybody say, You Belong Here. And this, me- yes, thank you. All those, all those lungs. Listen, what I want to say is that this message is probably not what you think if you're just going by the title. These next two weeks are not to persuade you why Real Life Church is the best church in Sacramento. <laughs> Though I think it is, that's not the purpose of this message. The purpose really of this message is for you to have a revelation Listen, of who you belong to and who you are in Christ as a son, as a daughter, as a child of God. And God, listen, he wants us to give a revelation that no matter where we go, listen, we belong. No matter where he leads us, no matter where he brings us, listen, we belong. Everybody say, I belong. And so we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 15 And Jesus has just finished uh, telling the stories of the parable of the lost coin and the lost sheep. And now he gets where he's about to tell the story of the lost son, or as many of us know this story, by the prodigal son. But before we jump into this parable, I'd like us to approach it perhaps in a way that you never have before. Because usually when we're talking about lost things or lost people or prodigals, we're talking about those people. (laughs) We're, We're talking about them. We're talking about people usually that are not in the room. But I want us to challenge, I want to challenge us. We're usually talking to us about children who maybe have wandered from the faith, young adults who've walked away from the church, or maybe adults who've gotten hurt by church leadership and want nothing to do with God anymore. This is the group that we usually classify as prodigals. And we pray one day, how you know, we do pray one day that they come streaming back to the church. There's nothing wrong with that perspective except for I'd like to challenge it over the next couple of weeks because I believe there is a clear message that God wants to speak to us to prepare us for this next phase of our journey together as a congregation. Listen, Amy and I, we just celebrated five years as your lead pastors. How many know number five is the number of grace? How many know number five is the number of grace? And I believe, listen, I believe five years and beyond is going to be filled with God's grace and God's favor, listen, for the harvest. How many know God wants to, God wants to rescue people? He wants to rescue and intervene and transform their lives. This is his heartbeat. I think the temptation, however, is that when we read scripture, we assume that we're reading it for someone else instead of us. And I want to challenge you. What is God saying to you through this passage? Today, my prayer is that you would be found by God. Wherever you're at, listen, whatever has been lost, whoever you have lost, whatever you have lost, if you're lost today, that this message would bring you into a sense of who you belong to and returning home like you've never experienced before. So can I encourage you today, listen, put yourself in this story. Don't project it on somebody else. Don't project the prodigal on somebody else. Listen, step into the shoes of the prodigal this morning and ask God, God, what do you want to speak to me today? Luke 15, 11 to 20, we're only going to read half of the story this week, but it says to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them the story that a man had two sons. And the younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. And so his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. 
Verse 13, a few days later, this young son packed all of his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money on wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve, and he persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him to the field to feed the pigs. And the young man became so hungry that even the pods He was feeding the pigs, began to look good to him, but no one gave him anything. And when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, God, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer of worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion, and he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. Father, I ask you this morning, God, to reveal to us who we are in you, that we belong to you, and what that means in this next season you're leading us in. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This morning is a call to deeper spirituality and a deeper community, not just with the people around you. But listen, a deeper spiritual life with Jesus. Come on, a deeper communion with the Holy Spirit. This morning, I want to talk to you about the enemies of belonging and what comes against that. Belonging, the spiritual definition of belonging is this. It is the spiritual reality that I belong to God. Can you just say that? I belong to God with every part of my being. We see that in Ephesians 1, that God holds me safe in in an eternal embrace, Psalm 91, that I am indeed carved in the palms of God's hands, Isaiah 49, and hidden in their shadows, Psalm 57, that God has fashioned me in secret, molded me in the depths of the earth, and knitted me together in my mother's womb, Psalm 139, as Pastor Jesse spoke about several weeks ago. It is the place where I hear the voice, you are my beloved, on you my favor rests, Matthew 3. And how many know, listen, the enemy will do whatever he can to get you out of that place of belonging. The enemy will fight you, he'll lie to you. Listen, he'll deceive you to get you, listen, to leave that place of security and safety that you and I can only find in the Father. When I was a young boy, I struggled with my weight. I don't know if we have a picture. There we go. I was made fun of a lot, and it created a lot of insecurity and It created an unhealthy thing in me, especially when I entered into junior high and high school. I I would do things just to belong, just to be accepted. I, I, I was experimenting with drugs in seventh grade, alcohol in eighth grade, and then started stealing things and, and doing all kinds of crazy, getting kicked out of class, talking back to the teacher. Nice Pastor Dean used to do all of these things. And why did I do that? Just that somebody would accept me. Just so somebody would stop making fun of me. Just so somebody would say, Dean, we accept you for who you are. But that didn't happen. They just kept calling me Dean, Dean, the jelly bean. (laughs) Fat boy, big D, everything. That's what they call me. But when I got saved when I was 17, I experienced God's unconditional love. And I experienced God's acceptance. Yet many times in my 20s, even though I was saved, even though I spiritually 
belong to a good church. I spiritually belong to Christ. Oftentimes, I was feeling like that little chubby kid on the outside looking in, even though I completely belonged in him. Isn't it crazy how an unrenewed mind will keep us in an unhealthy place? That an un- you Listen, you can be saved, you can believe, but listen, if you don't renew your mind... Come on, it will talk you out of belonging. Come on, it will talk you out of your place. It will talk you out of your authority. It will talk you out of your inheritance. Everything that you have in Christ, the enemy will talk you out of because you didn't deal with that deeper thing. And so today, come on, I'm committed to helping us get out of that unhealthy place by confronting the lies of the enemy that tell you you don't belong. And again, I'm not talking about a church, though I believe, listen, that God wants us to posture ourselves, listen, so that when people walk through these doors or they come to a church in the park or they go to our outreach or they just encounter us on the job or on the campus, listen, they sense and get the love Love and acceptance of a God who loves them, not judges them. And the first enemy of belonging is when we disconnect ourselves from the Father's heart. And this is where we choose performance over God's acceptance. In other words, you have something to prove. You ever been there? You ever been mad at somebody? Come on. You've been mad at somebody and you said, I'll show you. Oh, you didn't tell them, but you told yourself. And listen, if you're not careful, listen, you allow that incident to knock you out of your place. And listen, you begin to live this life, this Christian life, to prove who you are. To show everybody who you are. Luke 15, 12, the younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. Now you have to understand the context of this story for a son to ask his father for his inheritance before he passed away was basically to say, Dad, I wish you were dead. Other commentators say that if this suggests that a son, if a son would ask his father for his inheritance, it would mean that his dad was treating him poorly. And so what's Jesus setting this up? Listen, I don't know if anyone ever had a strained relationship with a parent in this room, but I would assume if you were wishing your father was dead, things at least from this younger son's perspective in this story, he thought he could do better on his own. Dad, give me what is mine. I'll show you. Dad, give me my inheritance. I'll prove to you. I don't need you in my life. I'll show you what I can do all by myself. Give me what is mine, and I'm out. Isn't that what the prodigal in all of us does when we feel like we've been treated unfairly or poorly? We want to prove ourselves to be accepted instead of accepting that fact that we've been approved. Now, remember who Jesus is talking to. He's talking to the most religious men of his day, the Pharisees. These guys wore their spiritual, come on, their spirituality on their slaves, uh, sleeves. They liked to uh, pray on the corner so that everybody could see them, so that they would receive the applause of men. They liked to see the, uh, people what they gave, right? Jesus said, hey, what you give and see, right? He talked against all this type of thing. What this son has asked for, this is what the Pharisees are thinking when Jesus is telling the story, is unimaginable. It's inexcusable. It's unforgivable. It's the ultimate insult that this son has asked for his, for his inheritance before his father's death. He has offended his dad. 
And so the Pharisees are thinking to themselves, so be it. So listen to the next verse. His father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. Now, I don't know about you, but if I would have asked my parents or said to my parents basically like, I wish you were dead. Listen, they wouldn't agree to anything after that statement. In fact, I think I would have been dead, right? So why would the father in the story who represents God the father be agreeable to something that from a human standpoint was unforgivable? Are you ready to go here with me? Why? Why did he agree to it? He could say no. If you want to run away, run away. He could have said, go, no, I'm not giving you anything. But he agreed to it. And why did he do it? God the Father is unoffendable. God the Father is unoffendable. And I believe with every fiber of my being that we as believers and a congregation must posture ourselves in the days that we are living in like the Father in the story did. Unoffendable. We have so many believers today living offended. I can't believe what that done. Did you see what that church down the street did? Wow. You're not doing it like us. You're not doing it like me. We're living in this culture of offense, not in the world, in the church. Okay, I know, I know. But God is asking us, can we live unoffendable? You see, the father divided his wealth between his sons because he didn't want wealth to get between him and his relationship with his sons. God chose to give everything to have a relationship with us, amen? He did that even even when we choose not to have a relationship with him. And as prodigals, yes, yes, I am suggesting this morning that there's a little bit of prodigal in all of us. And as prodigals, when we disconnect from the father's heart, we exchange God's reckless love for reckless living and we lose sight of his love, and we lose sight of his grace, and we lose sight of, the, of his acceptance, and we start down this path that we have something to prove that I'll show you what I can do in my own strength. We start working for God's acceptance, forgetting we've already been accepted. We start trying to prove to God our love for him like we haven't already been approved. You see, when I live my life knowing I belong, I'm not trying to work or prove anything to anyone. You see, when I have a revelation of belonging, I have nothing to prove. Why? Because I'm approved. Everybody say, I'm approved. I'm approved. Did you know Jesus said to his son, right? He said these very things, this, these very things that I said uh, at the beginning. He said, this is my son who I am well pleased. Did you know he said that to Jesus before he did anything? He had just been baptized in water, hadn't even went to ministry yet. And God says, I'm pleased with you before you do anything for me. And yet many of us, listen, many of us, we're trying and trying to prove our love and acceptance that I hope I could be good enough for God. No, no, no. He loves you right where you are. You see, to be approved and to be proven means that I live with the knowledge that I've been given his blessing that I have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. I live life with the guarantee of the Holy Spirit. Listen, whom in my body dwells. You are God's dwelling place. Listen, you are God's home. Everybody say home. You're his dwelling. He resides in you. You can't belong more than that. 
You can't belong more than you already belong if you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Why? Because you're endorsed and authorized. You're validated and valued. You're supported and backed. You've been given the, go- the nod, the go-ahead, and the green light. You've been given the okay and the thumbs up. This is just what happens when you believe. Before you do anything, can I say to you this morning that you belong? You see, I don't have to perform because I'm not what I do. I don't have to please because I'm not what people think of me. And I don't have to pursue possessions because I'm not what I have. You see, the revelation of belonging delivers me from this life and this thing called religion, and it's called performing. And God, listen, he wants to move us, listen, from this performance-based religion. Come on to having a revelation that we are fully accepted in Christ Jesus. Are you with me this morning? (laughs) The second enemy of belonging, listen, is distancing yourself from the father's home. How many know there's a difference between a house and a home? And this is where we choose pleasure over God's presence. Luke 15, 13, it says, a few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and he moved to a distant land and there he wasted all his money in wild living. My question to you this morning is how did he get there? Was it just a split decision that he just said, I'm going, I'm leaving? No, 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 no. Can I suggest to you that the son distanced himself in the heart long before he went to a distant place? And we have to be honest with ourselves here today that many of us are not where we should be spiritually, emotionally, financially, relationally, physically, nutritionally, not because someone did something to us, no, but because we chose to be in our current location. We chose to distance ourselves from the father's home. You see, the younger son dreamed of enjoying his freedom far from home and away from his father. But let make no mistake about it, the son was lost because of his, because of his own willfulness. It was his decision. Do I have any believers in here this morning that would just take responsibility for what you chose to do? <laughs> I'm including, I'm preaching to myself up here. Is there anybody besides me that would just say, yeah, God, I made a mistake. God, I messed up. I made a bad decision. Come on, how many know he is the God of the second chance? He hasn't given up on you. Don't give up on yourself. For years, I'm just kidding. Can I just go here for a second? For about 10 years, I would beat up myself for a decision I made to leave uh, when we moved from Santa Rosa. I would beat up myself because things didn't work out when we left. We moved to Houston. We were only in Houston for a year. Amy's saying, praise God on the front row. <laughs> it, nothing worked out. Nothing went to plan. And for years, I, for years, I lived with, man, I wish I wouldn't have made that decision. But how many know God can turn all things and work it out for our good. This is the God that we serve. And we're living in regret and remorse. Come on, live in a rerun when God wants to renew our mind to give you a new lease on life. You see, the, re- the, the reason many of us are having a tough time being present in the moment is because we've allowed our heart to distance itself from the reality of belonging. He wanted to have his own way. And so the son rebelled against his father and he broke his father's heart and he left his father's home. One commentator suggests this. He said, when Luke writes that the son left for a distant country. He indicates much more than the desire of a young man to see more of the world. He speaks about a drastic cutting loose from the way of living, thinking, and acting that has been handed down 
from generation to generation as a sacred legacy. More than disrespect, it is a betrayal of treasured values of family and community. The distant country is the world in which everything considered holy at home is disregarded. You see, it's easy to leave a house, but you have to choose to leave a home. Let me give you the definitions of the difference between a house and a home. A house is a building for human habitation. How many of you ever looked for a house? Right? If you've ever been looking for a house or an apartment, right, you're, you're going, you, 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 at least, you at least look at five to 10 unless God is on your side, right? <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's like this, like you go to house and sometimes when you walk in a house and you're looking for a house, is this just me and Amy or is this anybody? You walk in a house and you're like, nope, that's not it. I mean, you don't need, you can walk in the entryway, take a little whiff and turn right around. It's like, that's not it, right? I mean, there's these houses they call cat houses, smoke house. I mean, you walk in and you know, this will never, this will always be a house to me. It will never be a home for me. Anybody, Right. So a house is for human habitation. But how many of you have ever walked into that place and you're like, this is it. Come on, like you see the remodel already. You see the walls being moved. Come on, you see the backyard being manicured. You see its potential, right? And you say, this is where I'm going to belong. This is going to be my dwelling place. This is where I'm going to raise my family and my household. That's the difference between a house and a home. You see, when you refer to some place as a house, you are referring to a building which exists physically. But when you refer to some place as your home, you're talking about where you and your family will do life. Listen, the son left home. No one forced him. He chose to go. And when the son disconnected from his father, he not only disconnected With his dad, listen, he disconnected with his family, he disconnected from his community, and he disconnected from the life that he knew. This is what happens when God doesn't have our heart and we don't have his. Church becomes a house, not a home. Too many folks treat church like their house and not a home. I was talking to, we've had several families move out of state, and one of those families uh, called me recently, and they said, Pastor Dean, we are having a heck of a time finding a church like Real Life Church. Now, that made me feel kind of good, I'm going to be honest. (laughs) But I said, don't worry. I said, take the pressure off yourself, and Take this season to explore the different expressions in that current state and that current city that God has placed you in. And I promise you, come on, you're going to walk into some houses and you're going to say, nope, that's not it. And that's okay. But then you're going to walk into your home and you're going to say, this is where I belong. This is where I'm going to do life. This is where I'm going to have community. This is where I'm going to connect with God and others in worship. And this is what God does. You see, a home is somewhere you belong. It's a, place when, it's a place when you are gone, you are missed. It's a place when you're not there, it's not the same. Come on. It's a place that you don't have to wonder if you're welcome back. You know, my mom was really good at this because she created a home when I was growing up that I didn't really know it back then. You know, I just thought it was kind of cool. But like my cousin, my adult cousins would, I'm not, my adult cousins would come to live with us months, months on end. My cousin from Louisiana moved, lived with us for about two or three years while I was in high school. My grandma came and lived with us. My uncle came 
and live with us. It didn't matter what you were going through. Mom had a bed waiting for you. She didn't sit the family down and say, now this is what uncle did, and this is why he's here, and this is what your cousin did, and she didn't do that. No, 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 she said, you are here, you are welcome, and this is your room, and we're gonna take care of you, and we're gonna feed you. Why? Because you belong to this family. You don't have to prove that you're a part of this family. You don't have to show me that you're accepted. No, you belong. Come on, you're blood and you belong. You see, some of us are not connected to the bride, the church, because we're not connected to the groom, Jesus. Some of us are not connected to the home. Come on, because we're not connected to the Father's heart. See, you'll never find your purpose in pursuing pleasure, but you'll always find your pleasure. You'll always find pleasure when you're pursuing your purpose. Come on, why dwelling in his presence? Let me give you the third enemy of belonging, and it is this. It's detaching yourself from the Father's hand. And this is where we choose begging over belonging. You see, the prodigal walked away with a premature blessing because he discounted the power of belonging. He discounted his value as a son. He discounted his value as a child of a father. Come on, a wealthy father who had an inheritance. He discounted it all. And this is the crossroads in our journey as believers that we are forced to make a choice. And I really believe, especially coming out of this, these last three years, this season, listen, I believe, listen, we have a choice to make and it's this, am I going to stay in that distant place, disconnected from the Father's heart, detached from his hand, or am I going to run back to the place where I know I belong? Am I going to continue to run away or I'm going to run home. You see, Luke 15, 14 to 16, it says about that time, his money ran out. Everybody say, uh-oh. uh-oh. Can I just say this? God will speak to you through your money. And when your money runs out, can I just give you a little bit of a tip? <laughs> He's trying to get your attention. It says, when the money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. I see a lot of starving believers post-pandemic that are trying to talk themselves out of it. And God is intentionally, come on, the money's ran out, things have dried up, why? Why? because he wants us to pay attention to our spiritual lives. You see, God will dry up what's been feeding your carnal man so you'll begin to pay attention to your spiritual man. This is the season that we're in. You think we went through three years just to say, oh, that was a nice pandemic. When's the next one? No, no, no. That's not why we went through what we've been through. We went through it Come on. I mean, oh, God got us through it. But not, what, why did he get, it's important for us to understand why he did, so that we would pay attention to what he wants to do in our spiritual lives. Luke 15, five people agree with me. All right. Now, he persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. Let me just stop right there and just say there are going to be some messes, listen, that you're not going to be able to talk your way out of in this season if you don't pay attention to what God is wanting to do in your life. Some of you guys talk a good game, and God's tired of playing the game. Here is the lost son who was blessed with an inheritance, and now he's begging for something to eat. Picture this. He got an inheritance. 
And just a few verses later, out of recklessly living because he abandoned the reckless love of God, his, the reckless love that his father had for him, he abandoned that in exchange for reckless living. And now he's begging for what they're feeding the pigs. How many you know we're better than that? You see, the father's hand that provided the blessing for his life was the same hand that was lifted from his life when the young son decided to disconnect from belonging to the father's heart and the father's home. See, we want the father's blessing, come on, without the father's heart. We want the father's blessing, come on, so we can be distanced from the father. No, no, it does not work like that. It does not, you say, well, well, I'm gonna prove to you that I don't need anybody to live this Christian life. No, no, God, God created, come on, his people to live, come on, his word out together in community. It doesn't work so well by yourself. You say, I don't need the church. How's it going? I don't need people in my life. That's pretty lonely. God said it should not be, it's not good that man should be alone. You see, the Father's hands are providing hands. The Father's hands, come on, are protecting hands. He'll fight for you. And the Father's hands are praying hands. When I detach myself from the Father's hands, I detach myself from provision, from protection, and from spiritual covering. And if we're not careful, listen, we become the prodigal. You say, Pastor Dean, I've been in church 30 years. Yeah, you can become a prodigal. You say, I've been in church all my life and barely missed. You can become a prodigal. And what's that mean? It means that you just do what you want to do, living freely and recklessly and wastefully. Can I challenge you today? Is it possible as a son or daughter of God that we have spent a lot of our energy trying to please people instead of God? That we've exhausted a lot of our resources freely and recklessly trying to earn somebody else's approval and foolishly wasting our time, our talent, on our treasure. Why? Why? When we've already been approved, we've already been accepted. See, I think there's a part in all of us that thinks that we can manage the inheritance we've been given by our Father better on our own. Or let me put it this way, better all by myself. You see, we want the Father's inheritance without the Father's guidance. We want the Father's inheritance without the Father's input. We want the Father's inheritance without the Father's intimacy. There's a thing that exists in each and every one of us, this prodigal heart that is problematic, and it is this, that I want the rewards without any requirements, that I want my destiny without any development, that I want what's been promised without any process or people to deal with. And I want to receive from you, but I don't want a relationship with you. You see, we want what's in God's hand, but we don't want him to ask us how we are handling it. So let me take my inheritance and distance myself and disconnect from the Father's heart and detach from your hand. And Luke 15, verse 17 says this. When he finally came to his senses, the inheritance dried up. The money dried up. He's begging and he's not belonging. 
But I just thank God that this young son in the story came to his senses and he realized that I don't have to be in this pig pen. I don't have to be here. He said, I'm a son. I'm a, I'm a child of a dad who loves me, who's looking for me, who's waiting for me. And this morning, can I challenge you? Can I encourage you as your pastor? Listen, that you've been through a long season. And can I tell you, will you, can I encourage you? Will you come to your senses? Will you allow God to awaken you spiritually? Come on, will you stop numbing yourself with what other with, with whatever you're numbing yourself with? Come to your senses. And realize that you're a son, that you're a daughter, and that your dad can do better for you than you can on your own. You see, the enemies of belonging are going to be defeated when you and I have a revelation. Listen, that we are not paupers. But come on, we are princes and princesses. That you are royalty. That you are royalty, that you are a child of God. Listen, today you may be in here and you may have disconnected yourself from God's heart. You may have disconnected yourself or distanced yourself from God's home. You may have detached yourself from God's hand. You become desensitized. But today is the day that you come to your senses and you awaken, come on, to your sonship. Come on, you awaken to your daughterhood and you begin to understand today who, whose you are and who you belong to. And today, listen, I believe the Holy Spirit is inviting us to be embraced by him. Will you stand with me today? Hallelujah. You see, here's the thing that I want you to see, and we're going to pick up this story next week. He comes to his senses, and he goes, you know what? If I become an employee, it's going to be better than what I'm experiencing now. You see, he came to his senses, but he still, come on, didn't have the total revelation of who he was. He was saying, I'm, I'm going to go be an employee. I'm going to go work for my dad because I'll get fed better than I'm getting fed now. Listen, you got to keep renewing your mind because he was running back home thinking he was going to be an employee. But guess what he got? He got the father's embrace. He said, you're my son who I am well pleased, whom all my favors. You are my daughter on whom my favor rests. With every head. Thank you again for joining us. We pray that message ministered to your heart and lifted your spirit today. Hey, to find out more about joining the RLC online family, you can find us on the Church Center app. You can also subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't and follow us on Instagram and Facebook. God bless you.